Hello everyone, Christine here to welcome you to Footnoting History's very first History for the Holidays episode. For eight years now, our History for Halloween episode has been very popular. So this year, we decided to do an episode with the same format. That is, short bits from history covered by multiple hosts with a different theme. Instead of strictly Halloween, this episode will cover a wider array of holidays, starting with my entry, which centers on Christmas. In fact, it's actually a good segue from history for Halloween, because it's a Christmas ghost story. This particular Christmas ghost story appeared in Truman's Exeter Flying Post out of Great Britain on January 1st, 1857, and it contains something even scarier than skeletons. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's begin at the beginning as one always should. On Christmas night, a man named Mr. Cuncter sat in his house, comfortably enjoying the evening. He'd eaten well, drank well, and had an all-around good holiday, which he decided would be even better if he treated himself to a cigar he had stashed away. Mr. Cuncter went off to his workroom to fetch this much-desired cigar, but when he reached its location, he recoiled with shock. There, in addition to the cigar, were mounds of unpaid bills. Horrified by his tardiness at paying his debts, the man took his cigar and all but ran away from the room, hoping but failing to put the thoughts about his money woes aside. No matter what he tried, he could not get back to his previously merry mood. Eventually, he gave up trying to be happy again and took himself to bed, falling asleep for a bit before a rustling noise woke him. The noise was near his head and a cool breeze that slightly moved his bed hangings accompanied it. Terrified, he listened, and soon he heard voices out on the landing, ghostly voices. The low, horrible voices were counting, and one declared that when it comes to Christmas bills, the amount of time one is late takes precedence over the numerical size of the debt. Mr. Cuncter broke out in a cold sweat, but his fear did not stop a ghost from entering the room. The ghost approached our protagonist, and it was not human at all. It was a ghostly scroll. Upon the scroll, in fiery, angry letters, was the name of someone he owed money, the original date of the debt, and the amount he owed. Mr. Cuncter was beside himself, and this was not the only ghost bill to come see him. More and more arrived until he was sure that all the bills he discovered when searching for his cigar earlier were present seeking their revenge on him for his lateness in paying his debts had repercussions. The people he owed money were having tight Christmases because of him. The first bill, dated 1854, spoke to him, reminding him that payment had been sought over 20 times and he had been doomed to walk the night these last two years awaiting payment. Filled with fear, Mr. Cuncter asked the ghost bill how he could make him go away. And I bet you can all guess what the solution was. Pay your debts. And so he did what he had to do. The following day, he spent hours upon hours settling his debts by going around to the various tradesmen he had shafted for years and making good on his long thought false promises. That night, he slept soundly because unlike on Christmas, he had no unpaid bills to haunt his dreams. What a story. Lesson learned. Bills that you are able to pay, but merely have neglected to do so, will literally ruin your cozy holiday by coming to wake you up in the form of ghost bills are written out in fiery letters. Yikes. As you can probably surmise, I chose this one because when I saw the headline, Christmas Ghost Story, I was not expecting it to be about owing money. I hope it brought you a little bit of amusement, just like it did to me, sending you happy wishes for the rest of this year and all of the year to come. Hello, Footnoting History friends, it's Kristen here. Remember that time when George Washington was wandering around Valley Forge, all depressed in the winter of 1777, because things were not looking so good for the Continental Army? People were cold and sick and hungry, and a concerned George was taking a thoughtful stroll, looking for inspiration, when he saw a man lighting a Hanukkah lamp. Curious, he approached and asked the soldier what he was doing. And he explained the story of Hanukkah and Judah Maccabee. And George was inspired to throw his cape over his shoulder, get in that boat, cross the Delaware, and save America, puppies, and freedom. 
Later, a grateful George sent that soldier a silver menorah and a note that basically said, you know, Judaism's great and has a lot to offer the world. I'm proud of you, buddy. No? You don't remember that? Yeah, neither did I. But this is a very popular story that appears quite a bit in a lot of books about Hanukkah, in pedagogical materials, and yeah, you're not surprised, the internet. It's part of a folkloric tradition in American and Israeli Jewish culture, and there are some really nice lessons in here. And if this is a made-up story about the enlightenment of George Washington, well, it wouldn't be the first one. Folkloric stories, while they often are not true, tell us a lot about ourselves and where we've been in history. The way people have celebrated Hanukkah has changed over the years. We do know that Jews were commemorating a Maccabean victory over the Greeks as early as the 1st and 2nd century CE, but a lot of that early information is vague, and up until the 19th century, Hanukkah was more of a quiet commemoration of a miracle than the holiday that is observed today. So, maybe a continental soldier was observing Hanukkah in the 18th century. It was a thing, and there were certainly Jews in the American colonies, but Hanukkah wasn't really a big thing yet. But in the 19th century, Hanukkah saw a renewed importance during the early Zionist movement, when there was a lot of discussion about establishing a Jewish state in what would become modern-day Israel. The first George Washington Hanukkah story didn't appear in writing until 1954, after World War II. It was written in Hebrew, and in the story, the Jewish narrator compares the troubles of Valley Forge to his father's troubles back in Poland, and how his father reminded him that when things look bad, you should still light the menorah because the light will guide you. So that's what he was doing, and George Washington took that to heart. It's actually kind of a detailed story, but there are other versions that appeared in the 1970s and the 1990s, and now you can find a lot of them in both Israel and the United States. The relationship between George Washington and the American Jews is an uplifting one that is substantiated. At the museum at Turo Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island, you can view a letter George Washington sent to the Jewish community of Newport, which was one of America's oldest Jewish communities. He wrote it after his visit to Newport in August of 1790. Many Newport communities wrote letters to George congratulating him on his presidency, and George wrote back to the Hebrew congregation of Newport. He wrote that the government of the United States, quote, gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens, in giving it, on all occasions, their effectual support. George was on tour, trying to get all the states to ratify the 12 amendments to the Constitution that had been proposed. And while Rhode Island had ratified the amendments by the summer of 1790, the Jewish community of Newport was voicing its strong support for the First Amendment, which prohibited the establishment of a state religion and established the free exercise of religion and George was responding. It does make a little sense to see George Washington show up in this story. And depending on when you're listening to this, Hanukkah, that wonderful eight-night celebration of candles and fried goodness that Jews around the world celebrate every year, has come and gone. I know, I'm a little sad too. Any excuse to eat donuts and gamble with chocolate is my kind of holiday. But keep in mind this holiday season and others that Hanukkah also functions as a folkloric story with notes of Jewish national identity and lessons about religious tolerance. Happy Hanukkah! What's up, footnoters? It's Josh, and I'm excited to participate in Footnoting History's first ever history for the holidays episode. Kristen covered Hanukkah, Christine covered Christmas. So I thought I'd jump in with one of my favorite holidays, at least when I was younger, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. To say that I had some wild New Year's Eves would be an understatement. There were road flares, 
put in mouths and cli- and tree climbing with said road flares and mouths, pirate style. It-, it was a different time for me. But in any case, I was thinking about how we celebrate going out with the old, bringing in the new, and then I found this really interesting feature from the New York Times dated January 1st, 1856. And what was so interesting about it is it promised to show its readers the superstitions and customs surrounding New Year's in countries other than the United States. It featured Russia, Germany, France, and England. And to draw readers in, its headlines included How to See One's Future Spouse and Who is to be Kept Out of the House Today. I don't know about you, but that's exactly the sort of headline that's going to get me reading. So, whether these things are true or not, let's take a little look at how this New York Times writer believed other countries approached the changing of each year. Let's start, as the author does, with Russia. In Mother Russia, fortune-telling and future-predicting was allegedly the order of the night. One popular way to do this was to pour melted wax or lead into a basin of cold water and having someone with the knowledge of these things tell you what the shapes made by the wax or lead meant. But to me, the more interesting tradition we're told about is that single ladies and gentlemen would go outside, stop the first stranger they saw, and ask their name. This is important information to gather, because that name is the name of the questioner's future spouse. No explanation is given for what happens if you don't get married that year, and then have to repeat the process and get a different name, told to you the following year. In Germany, apparently, pouring lead or wax to tell the future was also common practice. But the Germans had a more, I guess, violent way of determining someone's marriage prospects. According to this article, a girl would sit on the floor with her back to the door and her feet spread out in front of her. Then she would throw up her right foot, I guess they're all very flexible at this point, and kick her shoe over her head. Well, if the shoe landed pointing towards the door, they would be married within the new year. If it landed the other way, well, maybe next year. I have to hope that not too many people were around when this occurred, because I could just imagine poor Johan sitting by himself, thinking that this strudel was the best thing that he had ever had, Uh, in that particular year, only to have somebody's loafer strike him in the nose. What a terrible way to start the year. Or maybe people were advised to do this more complicated but seemingly less painful ritual. As the clock strikes midnight, you peel an apple all the way from the top to the bottom and then toss the peels behind you. It's like they want to do a lot of tossing in the 19th century in Germany, I guess. And the peels will land on the floor, forming the first initial of the name of your future husband or wife. But if the peel breaks or some sort of accident happens, you are doomed to singleness until the time arrives to try again the next year. Seems like a lot of work. Hmm. Moving to France, we are told in no uncertain terms that although they used to celebrate the so-called Festival of Fools, where, quote, all manner of absurdities and indecencies were committed, end quote, after 250 years of this hair-raising frivolity, the government told them that they had to stop it, which, quite frankly, sounds like it made the day a lot less interesting. Also, this totally sounds like the French revolutionaries being a little bit killjoy. I mean, I can only imagine Robespierre being like, don't have fun, or guillotine. Happy New Year to you too, buddy. 
Don't worry, if you're looking for more traditions and superstitions, they are to be found in 19th century Britain. In Scotland, you could bring bad luck to your entire family for the year if you dared allow a woman to be your first visitor on New Year's Day. Want some good luck to counter that? Well, don't throw anything out, not even dirty water, until after January 1st has come to an end. It doesn't matter how smelly or dirty your house gets on the 1st. Throwing anything out takes your luck with it. Even that three-day-old haggis that hasn't been refrigerated. You. Down in England, though, you have a little bit of leeway. You're allowed to throw things out as long as something has been brought in first. You know, out with the old and with the new. I guess that makes sense. One final British belief was that if anyone, quote, should take a light from your house on New Year's Day, there would be a death in your family within a year. Because of this, our author writes that we should all warn smoking gentlemen to be sure they don't light their cigars inside the house that day. So, footnoters, have you experienced any of these traditions and superstitions? Or do you know anybody in any of these countries that has? Our New York's Time author, author McAutherface, in 1856, wrote with a very authoritative tone. So I very much want to know, has anyone kicked a shoe over their shoulder in Germany to celebrate the new year? From all of us at Footnoting History, to all of you out there listening, we wish you a very happy new year, with all the good luck, and absolutely none of the bad.